please stand for the reading of God's word. Today's scripture comes from Genesis 28, 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and laid down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairwell, stair, stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are laying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offerings and offsprings. I am with you and will watch over you where, wherever you go. I will bring you back to his land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob woke, awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the, the Lord is in this place, and I am not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on, on top of it. He called this place Bethel, through, though, though the city used to be called Luz. Luz when Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this, on, on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me I will give you a tenth you may be seated thank you well, there's no question about it. Jacob was on the run. He was literally running for his life. As he was on the journey, he thought back to what it was that had got him into this mess in the first place. You see, as, as long as he could remember, he had been trying to steal the firstborn blessing from his brother Esau. He felt like he deserved it because he was the smarter brother anyway. But he, he was born second by only seconds. In fact, the scripture tells us that when Esau was born, Jacob was holding on to his heel. So he had done all kinds of things throughout his life to try and steal that firstborn blessing. He had tried it with a pot of red soup, they say red beans, and that didn't seem to work. But later he finally pulled it out after all these years with a few pieces of goat skin and a well-prepared meal by mom himself. And yet he had won that firstborn blessing, and here he was on the run, literally running for his life. You see, his father and Esau weren't very happy about it. I mean, he knew the prophecy. He, he had grown up with it. It said that, 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 that there'll be two sons, and both of these boys will be fathers of great nations, and yet the older will serve the younger. So he had conspired with mom. You know, they thought that God was working a little too slowly, so they decided to give the Lord a hand. And they had tricked the aging father and the, and the brother. And he was, and look where it got him. After all that work, he was on the run, literally running for his life because Esau had threatened to put him out of his misery, quite literally. <laughs> And so mom packed him up, and under the guise of, of going to find a wife, she sent him off to Laban, her brother. That's a whole other story for another time. So here he was, the father of a great nation, the heir to the family for the fortunes the, and, all, and all of its resources, the one who had won that firstborn blessing. And what did that get him? He was on the run. He was sleeping on a, with a rock for a pillow in a place called Luz. I think that's somewhere near Sam in Idaho, isn't it? Luz. You can read this whole story in Jacob. As we go through it, there's some really important things that we need to 
to discover from God's word for us today. The first is this, the vision. In the midst of perhaps the lowest time in Jacob's life, it was a high point. He won the blessing, and now he's running for his life because his brother Esau really threatened to kill him. He was running because he was scared to death. The living, loving God who had made that promise to him so long ago appeared to him in a dream. It was one of those kinds of dreams that was so vivid that you remember every detail the next day, and you know in some way that it was way more than just a simple dream. And this is the promise that God made to him in the vision. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land upon which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the peoples on this earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I promised you. It was was like a light bulb went on in Jacob's head. You see, he had grown up with this promise. He had heard about it. He knew all about it. I mean, his grandpa was Abraham, right? His dad was Isaac. But it wasn't until this moment, sleeping on the ground, running for his life, that he realized that this was for him. This was truly his for the first time in his life. And it was like something came alive inside of him for the first time in his life. You see, see, this promise wasn't far away. It was right here and close up. Which brings me to the second, which is the promise. You know, he realized that this wasn't just another story that dad told one too many times at the dinner table. None of you guys do that, do you? My wife is reminding me, oh yeah, we've heard that before. Try not to repeat it 27 times. But he told it in his own words. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early that next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Bethel literally means, and we find out later, house of God, God's presence. So then, after the promise, he made a vow. If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and give me food to eat and clothes to wear so I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. This stone I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all that you give me I will give a tenth. You see, at this point he was running for his life. His next meal was in question. I mean, he was literally running. He was scared to death. He knew that if out God's help, he was in trouble. And do you realize how deeply this affected him? Did you catch that last part? Now, this isn't a sermon on tithing. But if you want to know how serious someone is about their commitment to the Lord, see how it affects their pocketbook. Right? Let's just, be, let's just be bluntly honest. We talk about this all the time. But if your relationship with God and your commitment to him does not affect your giving, your money, how you use it, how you spend it, let's be honest, it's not really our money. It's his money. He loaned it to us to be stewards of it, to use it for him. Can I tell you a little secret? If it's God's money and you give it away, Guess what God does? He gives you more to give away. I don't know how that works. I, I, I wish I could tell you. And this is one of those stories, I, I, haven't, I haven't told you the whole detail of it, but when I was in college, I was down to $5 in my pocket and no idea how I was going to do anything. And some guy that I hadn't seen in years walked up and said, hey, you want a job? I said, sure, when do I start? It was just a God thing. I had a, I had a job. God provided, not early enough for my liking, but right at the right moment. He took care of all my needs. 
And I thankful, I'm so thankful to my parents. That's one thing that they taught me even when I was a kid. And I got my 25 cent allowance. God got 2.5. That's kind of hard, so I usually rounded it up to three. That tells you how old I am, too, when I give God a three cent tithe. And then I read the story of the widow's mite, and I go that God blessed it. And then God gave me an idea. I would take my 25 cents, and God, I said, God, can you wait a day? I'll take my 25 cents, and I go buy five candy bars, and I'm really telling you how old I am now. And then I would take those five candy bars to school, and I would sell them and have 50 cents, so then I could give God a nickel <laughs> of tithe. But if you want to know how serious people are, see how it affects how they live their life all the way down to their money. From that point on, Jacob's life indeed was different, wasn't it? God did bless him. I mean, he, he made it to his uncle Laban's house, and, and, and that's a whole other story, and you'll find out that conniving runs in the family when you read that story, right? And God blessed him, and even through his uncle's conniving, he still came out a rich man when it was time for him to go home. All kinds of changes. You need to read from Genesis 25 on if you want to read the story about this family. You know, often people think, well, my family is so messed up. Read about this family if you think your family's messed up. It is amazing how God has used some of the most dysfunctional family units in the history of the world to accomplish his will and his purpose. So if he can do that, guess what? He can use you no matter what your stuff is. If you'll commit to him and allow him to use you. It's a great story, Pastor. Jacob and Esau and all that kind of stuff. But what does it have to do with me? Well, the application is this. I remember one time, it was a couple of years ago, it was in the summer, and I was sitting at the house reading a book. You know it was years ago, because right now all my spare time is spent working on the house. I don't get the chance to sit around and read a book too often. And it was one of those times when it was quiet, no one was there, I was reading my book, and all of a sudden I noticed that it was not just quiet, but it was too quiet. No, I stopped. I mean, it was just quiet, quiet. Then I discovered that the electricity had gone off. We don't realize how much noise there is just from the refrigerator and this and, you know, all those things that click and buzz and whistle and groan and moan and, and all those things in the house. And, and I, I begin to think about it. That's not too bad right now, but it is summer. And then I go, well, you know what? It's starting to get a little hot in here. And then you start to go, what if the electricity doesn't come on? You know, we got food in the refrigerator, and it's all going to spoil, but we have an electric stove, so we, we can't cook the food, so then our food's going to all get ruined, and, and there's no air conditioning, it's really going to get hot, and, and oh no, there's no TV, and it's playoffs, and I can't watch TV, I can't watch the game, I, oh, just silence. And it was in that moment of silence when I got through all of that, mental gymnastics that God began to speak. Isn't it amazing what God has to do sometimes to get our attention? I think Jacob's problem is our problem. We get so used to God in our lives and, and, and doing the, the God thing. Does that make sense? going to church and, and serving God and all of that, we can get so used to it that we take it for granted. Have you ever taken your relationship with the Lord for granted? It is amazing how many people I know who God literally saved their lives. I mean, they were heading straight for, de for destruction, and God got a hold of them and turned them around and literally saved their lives. And just in a few short years, they're as boring and as bored as everyone else. Was that too harsh? You see, God wants to be active in relationship with us. Remember last week, that word pros proskunao that I talked about, the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us is that that eye-to-eye, -eye, that lip-to-lip, -lip, that breath-to-breath -breath relationship, that up-close and intimate relationship. And you know, you can't have that kind of relationship from a distance. 
I mean, we've done this church thing so many times that we can almost do it in our sleep, and sometimes we do, right, Lori? Yep, right. <laughs> She's gone. Do you understand? Did you know that God is here? Right now in this place, God is here. The God of the universe is in this place. Do you realize how much he wants to pour out upon us? How much he wants to inspire us? How much he wants to touch us? How much love he wants to flow through us to each other? Do you understand that there are people here today, right now, that won't understand how much God loves them unless you show it? And more than show it, say it. I need to ask you to forgive me sometimes because I'm not one who says it very good, as my wife knows. I'm, I'm not quite this bad. I, I, you know, like the, the elderly couple who went in for counseling, and the guy said, what's the problem? And she said, he never tells me he loves me. And the guy looked shocked. He said, I told her when I married her, if I ever change my mind, I'll tell her different. I'm not quite that bad. It makes sense to you. <laughs> not just your spouse, not just your kids, but each other. We need to tell people that God is here, that God loves them, that God has incredible things in store for them. We need to tell him that. Did you know that God has a wonderful plan for your life? It's more than a motto, it's a reality. If you are truly his, there's no question that that's true. God has a plan for your life. He does. He has incredible things in store for your life. But he won't force you. You have to choose it. And you know what? I'm the kind of guy that's just stubborn enough that I'm going to hang on until I get it. Because I believe it. God does have incredible things in store for us. God wants to bless us. He wants to walk these aisles. He wants to touch you in ways that you've never been touched before. So I want you to do something with me. Just see if you can. Stop the wondering thoughts for a minute. and Be quiet before the Lord. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. And let it out slowly. And listen to the Holy Spirit as he breathes spiritual oxygen into this place today. See, God most often doesn't talk in the noise, even though he's present there. He talks to us when we're quiet. Listen to the word. His words to Jacob are his words to us today. I am the Lord, the God of your first father Abraham and his son Isaac. I will give you and your family victory in the land where you are now living. Your spiritual descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the east, the west, the east, the north, the south. All those to whom you minister will be blessed through you and your spiritual offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will always bring you safely back to your home. I will not leave you ever. And the great work that I have promised you, we will accomplish it together. Did you know that the place that we are today is Bethel? This is God's house. I love this place. And I, sometimes I can imagine in the spiritual realm, if if, if we could see into the spiritual realm, there would be a stairwell starting right here and it goes straight into heaven and there's angels on it. And the cool thing is in heaven, the Lord of hosts is right there. You see, we often think of heaven as something way out there that we don't even... It's right here. Did you know this is holy ground? 
It's not holy because of us. It's not holy because of the stained glass or the cross. It's, it's not holy be because of anything that we can do. It's holy because where God is is holy ground. This is a holy place. God is here. Do you know the song? We are standing on holy ground And I know that there are angels all around Let us praise Jesus now We are standing in his presence on holy ground. We have to stand if we're going to sing this right. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. And he is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. He is here, holy, holy, I will bless his name again. He is here, listen closely, hear him calling out your name. He is here, you can touch him. You will never be the same. He is here today. Pray with me, Father. We know that you are here. <laughs> and I believe that you are calling some names today. You're speaking to people and you're telling them how much you love them and how pleased you are with them. And how much you want to use us and how much you want to bless us and how much you want to, uh, to work through us and in us in this community. Maybe, Father, as you're speaking to some, you're telling them that you want them to be closer to you. So if God is speaking to you this morning and you need to spend some time praying, um, I invite you to do that. I know you can do that in your seats. That's always great. But maybe you want to come to the altars because you hear him calling your name today because he wants to touch you in a way that you'll never, ever be the same. If he's calling you today, would you respond with a yes? Father, help us to respond with a yes to allowing you to work in us and through us to radically transform us into the men and women that you want us to be so that we can impact our world for you. Thank you, Father, because you are here. And my prayer for us is that you would visit us in ways that is so undeniable that we can't miss it. My prayer is that we would get so excited, that we would get so up to date and in tune in our relationship with you that, that others can't help but see it. My prayer, Father, beyond everything else is that, that you would show around the edges of our life to everyone we meet. My prayer is that we would have no children who go, I don't know anyone like that.
My prayer is that our kids would see Jesus all over us and in us and through us and around us and that his love would just splash all over them. Lord, help us to be those kind of witnesses. Not here only, but in our homes in restaurants, in our schools, in our places of business, everywhere we go, that we would just splash your love on people. Because, Father, I believe that you do really want to touch us. And I think that we know, Father, that when you do touch us, we really are never the same again. Thank you, Father, for meeting with us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for changing us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you. Help us to say it often. To you and to each other as well. In your Son, our Savior's name, we pray today. Amen, Father. Amen. Amen. Greet those around you with, if you are comfortable, with an I love you. Thank you.